some of the uh, promotional material for this describe me as a genius statistical genetics wonder. Pretty accurate, I think. I'm sure my sister watching at home would agree wholeheartedly with every adjective. I am a statistical geneticist. What it means in my case is that I studied statistics and I apply that to genetics data. Um, I always have trouble telling people what I do. Statistical geneticist sounds pretentious, even before you add the genius wonder, as I'll do from now on. I always want to tell people one or the other, and if I tell people that I do genetics, the response is, that's fascinating, I wish I did that, but it seems dishonest because that wasn't really my field of study. But if I tell them that I do statistics, the response is, that was always my least favorite subject, how do you live with yourself? And so now I just go with statistical geneticist, which confuses people, they're like, you're kind of half okay, half horrible, I don't know. But based on these responses, uh, today I'm going to highlight the genetics bits of my research and keep the statistics buried pretty low beneath, though talk to me afterwards, you want to hear the really exciting parts. So what do you need to know about genetics for this talk? Well, your DNA is a sequence of A, G, C's, and T's, much like this, this uh, made-up example that I have here. In reality, you inherit a three billion long sequence from each of your parents. And so each of these rows here is referred to as a chromosome, and in any particular genetic region like this, you have two chromosomes for that region, one from mom, one from dad. And here's a couple of other individuals in this made-up small region of DNA. Now, these letters stand for something important. I don't know what, I'm just a statistician. But overall, the vast majority of your DNA in a sample of chromosomes like this, over 99%, will be identical. I will focus on the most common type of genetic difference, which are locations where a sample chromosome could be one of two things. So for example, at this third location, it can either be a G or a T and nothing else. And at the second to last one, it can either be a T or an A and nothing else. I'll ignore the DNA that's identical. And even though these differences are relatively rare, we have so much genome that there's enough of these differences that we can make comparisons amongst individuals. And so that's the data. The second and final bit of biology you need to understand is how you inherit your DNA. So here's you at the bottom, you've got your two chromosomes representing any particular region, and here are your parents. I'll go ahead and assign a unique color and pattern to each of your parents, and then I'm going to color you based on the DNA that you've inherited from them. And so you get one chromosome from mom and one from dad, like so. I can do the same thing with your grandparents. Here they are. I can assign each of them a unique color and then color you according to the DNA that you've inherited from them. And so mom and dad get a chromosome apiece from each of their parents, and then they're each going to pass along a chromosome to you. Now, it turns out that mom, for example, doesn't just pass along the blue or the green, but often some sort of mixture of the two, like so. This is because of a process known as recombination. I do know some biology. And you don't need to know anything about this process other than that it causes this to happen, at least with this talk. So in this picture, I've made a recombination happen just to the right of center in this cartoon. And the net effect is that the left segment of your DNA, in blue, comes from the corresponding left region of grandma, and the right part, in green, comes to the corresponding right region of grandpa. And so who you're related to changes along your genome. And same with the chromosome that you get from dad and how you relate to your grandparents on that side. And overall, you're expected to get 25% of your DNA across your whole genome from each of your four grandparents. Now, alternatively, I can color your grandparents' DNA and your DNA by that of your great-grandparents. So you've got eight of them. And so overall, you're expected to inherit an eighth of your genome from each of your eight great-grandparents. And maybe you look like this. And I can go back much, much further as well. Say to your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, if I go back, for example, 10 generations, you have over 1,000 ancestors. And so from any particular one of them, you're only expected to inherit less than a thousandth of your genome. So say you look like this. One thing I want you to note is that the sizes of segments in you, compared to these ancestors, are much smaller than when I compared you to your grandparents. This is because there's many more generations separating you from these ancestors, and so more time for these recombinations to happen and make these segments smaller. But generally, I can take any point in time and then color you by the DNA of your ancestors from that time. So here's you, colored by the DNA of your ancestors from 10 generations back, and here's a couple of individuals unrelated to you, colored by the DNA of their ancestors 10 generations back. Now, by unrelated here, I mean that these people are not first or second cousins. That's the type of data that I deal with. If we took a DNA collection from all of us in this room, that would be a collection of unrelated individuals. As far as I know, I'm unrelated to any of you. And if you happen to be here with a relative, we just randomly throw one of you out of the room until we had an unrelated sample again. But I keep using verbal air quotes here because really none of us are unrelated in a genetic sense. If I have over 1,000 ancestors 10 generations back, 
It's not inconceivable that some of those ancestors might have passed down DNA via some other family tree to some of you. And to illustrate this in this admittedly made up example, I've highlighted regions where these unrelated people nonetheless share the same ancestor. And in fact, if you look at any particular part of your genome, if you go back far enough in time, any two individuals, for example, me and you, will share an ancestor for that region. It may not be human, but it's there. But importantly, you'll share an ancestor more recently with some individuals than others. So it could be that if I look at one segment of my genome, I share an ancestor with you 10 generations ago, and you 20 generations ago, and maybe you seven. And perhaps out of everybody in this room, seven's the smallest number, and so you win. I'm more closely related to you than anybody else in the room at this particular location. But everybody else shouldn't be jealous. At the next location, I might be more closely related to somebody in the back of the room. But what I can do is I can take my DNA then and compare it to all these unrelated people. And so now this is me at the bottom, and these colors refer to which chromosome of these people I'm most closely related to at each position in my genome. And so how do I know this? Well, if you recall, there is data here. So imagine that each of these unique colors is a unique sequence of these A, G, Cs, and Ts. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking my sequence and identifying who most closely matches my sequence at each spot along my genome. And that's basically what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. That is the statistical geneticist in action. So say furthermore, I know that these first four individuals are sampled from some Native American group, and these bottom three from a European group. Well, I can assign these groups unique colors, say blue and red, and then color me by the, deep, the people that I've matched up to genetically. And from this configuration, suddenly it looks as if I'm a mixture of the DNA of these two different groups, i.e. at some point in the past, members of these groups must have intermixed and then passed that mixed DNA down to me. And more generally, this might happen if one group's a local population and then a group of migrants come into that region and intermix with that local population. And even better, we can date precisely when the two groups intermix by considering the size of the blue and red segments in me today. Generally speaking, the longer the uninterrupted red and blue, the more recently the two groups mixed. Well, if they're smaller, the longer ago they must have mixed. If you recall, when I formed you out of your grandparents, those segments were longer than when I formed you out of your great-great-great-grandparents. It's the exact same idea. And so you can use the size of segments in people today to determine precisely when these groups mixed. And so DNA keeps a record of these events. And now I'm finally getting to what the point of this talk is. And so what you can do is you can use DNA to detect whether migrants have intermixed in any particular part of the globe or any particular region, even if, for example, some people in that region might believe that they've been fairly genetically homogenous or isolated for a long time. Here's a real data example. One group we've looked at are the Maya, a Native American group located where this uh, red dot is. We compared their DNA to that of some other 90 worldwide groups, and we found that they primarily matched the DNA of other neighboring Native American groups, as you might expect. Those groups share similar history. But 19% matched to a different source, which looked most genetically like the modern-day Spanish out of all of the 90 groups. Looking at the size of segments, we dated this contribution to 1670, or 1642 to 1726, to put some uncertainty around it. And this fits nicely with the arrival of conquistadors who came from precisely this part of Europe into this part of the Americas. And it suggests, this is something that we know quite a lot about historically, and it suggests that this technique is working. And so I mentioned that we had some 90 worldwide groups. In fact, we have 95. Here they are. And so we could take each one of these groups and ask the same question. Did they show evidence of intermixing with other regions? And if so, who and when? And it turns out that the answer is largely yes. These groups in red are ones where we detect clear intermixing with other regions. The ones in gray are where we detect something but can't quite tell what. And the ones in white are where we do not detect anything. But as I'll demonstrate later, in many cases, this is probably just because we didn't have enough samples in this particular data set. And so overall, it's quite plausible that every single group of humans on the planet, or very nearly that, have all interacted with migrating groups within the past 4,000 years. Humans are an interactive species, and it turns out that we really enjoy exchanging DNA with one another. <laughs> Some historical groups have been particularly good at spreading their DNA. One you might have heard of is Genghis Khan in the Mongol Empire of the 13th and 14th centuries. And several populations that currently live in the region spanning the former Mongol Empire, we detect a clear genetic contribution from a group that looks most like present-day Mongolians, for example, a sizable amount in the Uyghur, but also the Uzbekistani, Hazara, and a smaller amount as far west as modern-day Turkey. In each case, we dated the contribution precisely to the era of the Mongol Empire, suggesting that that's a plausible source of this DNA. Now, the Mongols aren't the only army in history. Another interesting group, the Kalash, also live in the region of the former Mongol Empire, here, and yet we don't detect any genetic link between them and present-day Mongolians. 
The Kalash live in a fairly isolated and mountainous region, so perhaps the Mongols missed them as they marched across Asia. But the Kalash weren't always missed. We do detect a contribution in them, one of the oldest in our data set, possibly because of this isolation. It dates to older than 200 BC from a source that looks most genetically like Northwest Europeans today. Now, we don't really know what this genetic signal is referring to, and at some point trying to link these signals to stories becomes a bit more of an art than a science. But nonetheless, it's fun to guess, and traditionally in my field, if you're going to venture forward some half-educated guesses, which might be completely false, it's customary to say that this data is consistent with this particular story. And so some members of the Kalash community believe from oral traditions that they are direct descendants of the armies of Alexander the Great, and this date and source is consistent with that particular story. Although, of course, there could be other explanations. So here's an example where DNA can shed light on oral traditions or other anthropological or archaeological records and how likely they are to have actually happened. Another interesting region is Eastern Europe. In each of these six groups here, we detect a genetic contribution from a source that looks genetically like groups as far away as Northeast Asia in red here. For example, the small amount, only 2% in modern-day Lithuanians, not the Mongols this time, although it's coming from a similar part of the globe, but earlier, older, we think, our best guess, the seventh century, and we see a similar signal, uh, date and amount, in Belarusians, Polish, Hungarians, Romanians, and Bulgarians. This signal is consistent with the migrations of people from the Asian steppes during the first millennium, maybe the Huns. I mean, it could be lots of other explanations, but that sounds like a, a sexy one. Uh, but what's interesting is in these six groups, at the same time, we detect another contribution from a completely different group occurring at the same time, this one more European-like. So, for example, in the Lithuanians and Belarusians, we detect a larger contribution from a group that looks like modern-day Polish. This European signal is consistent with the expansion of Slavic-speaking peoples in Eastern Europe and suggests that perhaps this expansion was happening around the same time as the contribution of DNA from these invaders from the Asian steppes, perhaps because the Slavic speakers were running away from the invaders of the Asian steppes. And so perhaps because of this, in modern-day Greece, as far south as there, we detect a genetic link to Poland that dates to the same time period. A couple of centuries later, we see DNA going the other direction, from west to east, and the two of China and the Han of northern China, perhaps suggesting romance amongst traders traveling the Silk Road. And overall, the sum total of everything we see looks like this, which again suggests that anywhere you care to look, you'll see these different genetic links between regions. What about the United Kingdom in green here, where we are today? where in this data set, we did not detect any signs of intermixing. Well, we got a bigger data set. So here we've got over 2,000 individuals. Each black dot here is a person placed on the map based on where they come from, or more accurately, where their grandparents come from. Now, you might think, or at least I would have thought, that the UK is fairly genetically homogenous or similar. But if you did think that, you'd be right. They are, relatively speaking. Yet there are, it turns out, detectable differences. We took these individuals and we clustered them into groups based only on looking at their DNA, and in particular based on who shares lots of matching DNA patterns. This is the result. So each color here refers to a cluster of genetically similar individuals who look subtly genetically different from the other clusters or colors. And so you can see that there's a striking correspondence between genetics and geography across the United Kingdom, to the point that in some cases we can tell which county you come from just by looking at your genome. <laughs> And so we wanted to learn a bit more about why these differences might exist and if they might relate to past migrations from the continental Europe into the UK over the centuries. So to do so, we took this DNA and we compared it to all of these different regions in black in Europe here in this inset map. And here's the results of that. And so there's one pie chart for each UK cluster, and each pie is showing the proportion of DNA matching to these places in continental Europe according to this key on the inset map at left. And so, for example, you see a lot of gray everywhere in the UK, that represents the majority of genetic matching to Europe, which turns out to largely be France, go figure. But there's also a sizable red component in Southeast England. That represents matching to Denmark and Northern Germany. That signal is consistent with the migrations of Anglo-Saxons who came from precisely that part of Europe and settled into precisely that part of the United Kingdom in the fifth and sixth centuries. And we've dated this contribution, suggesting that's the case. Now, the Anglo-Saxons were known to have brought with them a massive cultural transmission in that they completely replaced the existing language and material culture. And so it's been an open question as to whether they also completely replaced the people, so that an Englishman today would ancestrally be 100% Anglo-Saxon. Well, the DNA evidence tells us no, that actually looks like the Anglo-Saxons intermixed with the pre-Saxon locals depicted by these gray components here. Meanwhile, as you go north, the red disappears and gets replaced by green. That represents matching to modern-day Norway. 
That's at its highest in the northernmost pie, which is the Orkney Islands, and that's consistent with their history. Following the Norwegian Viking conquest of the 8th and 9th century, Orkney was annexed by Norway for about 500 years until the 1460s. And so even within an island as relatively small as the United Kingdom, you detect these different migration events, and the sources of these migrants vary across the UK. And so we can update our map here to show these other links. And again, it suggests that as we look more closely or add more samples to these groups in white, we'll unearth some signals that we missed the first time. But one thing I haven't told you is that in many cases, samples from these groups were carefully selected to avoid the effects of recent migration in the last century or so. So for example, cities were avoided because often lots of migrants go into cities, and um, individuals were excluded from the analysis if they happen to look genetically different from the other members of their group. Now, in reality, populations are mixtures of lots of different individuals, each with their own unique genetic signature. And of course, it's a lot easier to move around nowadays with globalization and discount flights that the Mongols didn't have access to. But the point is that even if you try fairly hard, as researchers did in some of these cases, to identify groups that have been fairly isolated, it turns out they haven't been isolated. They've intermixed with some other group in the past 4,000 years. Humans like to move around from early explorers to gap year students, and as a result, our DNA is a mixture of all of these different migrating groups, sometimes linking us to quite distant parts of the globe. So attempts to try to justify these ideas of anti-immigration or xenophobia to uh, preserve kind of the genetic purity of your part of the globe, it's too late. <laughs> Migration's been happening for centuries, it's continuing to happen and will continue to happen. And DNA helpfully keeps a detailed record of these ancient and recent ongoing links. Thank you.